I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler on tonight's episode. We'll spend the first couple of bits here, both two and four bits, catching up on that Jaden Rashada drama and the aftermath from this NIL fueled fiasco. Uh, some words of wisdom uh, coming through, in my opinion. Will might have a different opinion here from <laughs> from a former Gator, and the offensive line. Gets a boost in the transfer portal. Wrap up the show on that front. Uh, Will, let's just dive right in here. Uh, Tuesday night, this past, uh, it really, it's actually tonight. We're filming on Tuesday night. Uh, according to Brandon Huffman of 24 7 Sports, five star Jaden Rashada, quarterback Jaden Rashada, has officially filed for a release from his national letter of intent to the University of Florida. Edgar Thompson of the Orlando Sentinel reported that issues with the dis- uh, stem from a disagreement over uh, Rashad's $13 million deal. That's the figure that Thompson reported. Uh, we're not even totally sure if that amount is correct. Will Thompson says he got it from, I mean, obviously reputable reporter there for the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, but it, the things you've been hearing, this story has been beyond frustrating. I mean, if you hate NIL already, that, which I know that it's not something that a lot of fans love, but if you don't like NIL, this story is not for you because I'll tell you what, man, it's been beyond frustrating trying to follow it because the details are so few and far between because it's a situation which is likely headed toward litigation. So we have to stress this here that uh, we're going to, we we don't, we're not going to totally try to speculate tonight, but we do want to go over some of the scenarios that have been reported and obviously, you know, you know, maybe try to read between the lines a little here and there, but try to stick to the general frame of what's already been reported out there. Will. so let, let me let me dive in right now to G Allen Taylor of the athletic. He reported a timeline of events this past week. Uh, he laid out November 10th, uh, 2022 here. Rashada and the Gator Collective agreed to terms on an NIL deal exceeding $13 million. Such a massive pledge is thought to dramatically exceed the Gator Collective's fundraising level, so the deal presumes assistance from Hathcock, that's Hugh Hathcock, and or other Gator Guard donors. After signing the contract, Rashada decommits from Miami and flips to Florida. On December 7th, Eddie Rojas, who runs uh, helps run the Gator Collective, he sends a termination letter regarding the $13 million contract, uh, according to a program source close to the situation. Uh, there are conflicting accounts on why the deal crumbled and who, who refused to pay what, but that's the first situation we have from G. Allen Taylor of The Athletic Will. Let's go through that scenario first. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's a couple of things there. One is that early signing day, it was December 20th this year, Mm -hmm. which means that the contract that was drawn up, assuming that this reporting is correct, was 13 days. Like the termination letter goes out 13 days before the national um, letter of intent was signed by Jaden Rashada, which means that somewhere in that time frame between when there was a termination letter sent out and when he signed on that line for that NLI, um, there, there were conversations that had to have gone on about what was actually going to be the compensation, right? At some point, those discussions, and you assume that those discussions went well to a point where Rashada decided to sign because he could have waited until February to sign. So the fact that he went ahead and signed on the early signing day, um, I, I do think is reflective that at least in better times, the, uh, the, the two sides were relatively close or at least thought they were relatively close. But that to me is maybe the most interesting part of that reporting is just if you look at the fact that Rashad assigns early signing day, December 20th, well, December 7th, he's already got that termination letter for the $13 million contract. I don't know what conversations went on. You don't know what conversations went on over those 13 days, but certainly I think the expectation was, or the expectations from both parties were different in terms of what was going to be delivered. I think that's probably the crux of, of the disagreement and sort of why we're at where we're at. So just to paint the picture for those of you who, I mean, I got to say, if if we weren't doing this uh, podcast here, Will, I don't know how closely I'd be following all the details of the NIL world anyway. Uh, But just for those of you who don't follow it that closely, you have the Gator Collective, which I, I don't know the monthly rate, Will, but it's under 10 bucks, right? 
I think it's more than that. And and you can, you can put different donations in. Yeah. But you can basically, I would describe the Gator Collective. It's for your average fan, right? That wants to donate something and contribute to the cause uh, at NIL at Florida. And they were one of the first ones to really pick up the banner and run with this here in this new era, right? Uncharted territory. These are third party sources that are not officially connected to the school. All right. So keep that in mind when you talk about Billy Napier and Scott Strickland. You have some interesting thoughts on that here in a little bit, Will. But this is a third party entity that has nothing officially to do with the school. Nor uh, are they allowed to legally. I mean, right. the, the, how, would they know, how would they know who to send the contracts to and who to pay? That's an interesting question of what, how they could possibly receive such information. But, you know, we'll all pretend like things don't happen. So, like it's it's a ridiculous setup it's a ridiculous setup uh, across the board but this is what the this is what college football is doing across the board this is not a unique thing to florida every school struggling i just read an athletic article about the iowa collective they're angry at the athletic department because the athletic department won't share their season ticket information uh, football season ticket information with the Iowa collective. And they're like, well, how we, you know, we got, so we got to build our own des- database. We're trying to help you. And the athletic department's like, we don't give away information to third parties. So I, look, if you think NIL problems are unique to Florida, like I would encourage you to pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the country. This just happens to be one of the biggest. You got a five-star quarterback, a gigantic dollar amount. So, of course, this is going to get huge national attention here. But the Gator Guard, you got the Gator Collective and the Gator Guard, right? So when it said, G. Allen Taylor mentioned it, it's not thought the Gator Collective can fund such a level. Hey, I'm sure the Gator Collective is raising a good deal of money. I'm not sure they're funding our $13 million quarterback. The Gator Guard, I mean, these are the big donors you're talking about. Guys like like a Hugh Hathcock. I know I think Darren Heitner's involved with the Gator Guard as well. Will you could correct me if I'm wrong on that. But that's more for they they kind of fill in the gaps when there's gaps that exist. So you ask how miscommunications could happen. These are technically separate entities on paper, right? So one entity is doing the negotiating and one entity is there to fill in the gaps. That's potentially how a miscommunication can occur, correct? Sure. I mean, look, I, I think none of us really know exactly how these things are structured. And and the fact that Rojas signed the contract, at least reportedly from from Taylor and the, and the athletic article, right. um, the fact that Rojas is signing the contract means that they've been given the authority or at least have taken the authority to execute contracts. Now, why the termination was set, they're not entirely clear on that, right? Is it a funding issue? I think Josh Pate um, had had on his podcast, it specifically said there was a funding issue that Florida couldn't come up with the funds. Now, I don't know whether that is accurate or not, but if that is accurate, then yeah, you probably figure that it's a miscommunication between the collective that's executing the project or executing the contract and the funding sources that it has to draw on in, it, in order to execute the pro in order to execute the contract. And, and that does become an issue, right? Because you're essentially signing up for something that you can't fund. And then that's when, that's when lawyers get involved. Right. Yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, I think when you sort of look at the tea leaves, that's probably what happened. But again, whether or not that's that's specifically what happened, I don't know. I know. So Heitner's a little bit different because he's he's actually an NIL attorney um, who is associated with some of, uh, you know, if you he, he's he's repeatedly tweeted about the agency that reps Rashada. But the agency that reps Rashada uses Heitner to draw contracts. There's all sorts of weird connections that that are going on here, and and I have you know again I have no idea how Heitner is actually involved in all this stuff. I don't I don't have that kind of information. But he's not I don't think a member of the guard. I think he's he's related to this in terms of his his lawyer his lawyer skills are being utilized by different, different people within the space and how, how exactly he's, he's connected. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I was under I the impression on. that he had a significant hand in uh, helping start the Gator guard. I was under that impression, but I mean, I, he, again, he may have, I just, I, I just don't know. Right. So, yeah. and, and I don't think it's important for the, for the overall story. I mean, I think what, what it really sort of boils down to in, in many ways is that given the reporting that's out there, it, and given the dates that are put forward, and that's the important part is the dates in the athletic report. If those are true, then what that suggests is that there was a $13 million deal on the table back in December or late November. That's what that's what causes Rashada to flip. Rashada flips, and now Florida is left with figuring out how to fund that deal. And somewhere in the line, somewhere in the chain, whether it was the staff saying, 
this is way more than we want a player to get, whether it was the collective saying we don't have the money, whether it was the people through the Gator Guard not being able to fund it. I have no idea what's going on. What I will say is, is that if in fact, um, like if you're Rashada, you <laughs> promises had to have been made for you to sign on early signing. Day. Right, right. Because otherwise that's, you that's just wait until February. Sense. Right. Well, and, and you've, 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 so th- there, there have been a couple of reports. I think he, uh, he was supposed to enroll early, right? Yeah. He was supposed to be starting. The reason why, so that's why there might have been some urgency in signing in December because the plan might have been we want to get you in, come through spring practice. Whereas if you wait till February, you're not going to be a part of that. Certainly, but the minute you sign that national letter of intent, you've given up a lot of the leverage that you might have, mm-hmm. right? So there was always a risk that Rash- – and we didn't know what the financial details were. But when Rashada flipped from Miami to Florida, ostensibly for a larger NIL deal, and that seems to be what, what, what was the trigger, right? There was always the risk that he might get another deal someplace else, right? So you want to lock those people down and make sure that they can't go anywhere. And one of the ways that you do that is with the national letter of intent. That's why now here on Tuesday night, he's had to ask out of that national letter of intent. He can't just go sign with some other program and go play there and, and sign an NIL deal at those places. He's now locked into Florida for at least some amount of time. So he loses his leverage when he signs that NLI to come to Florida, which would make no sense then if you didn't have assurances that you were going to get what you thought you were going to get. And then the fact that there was back. So again, I think it it all comes down to communication. It all comes down to strategic vision and communication and being able to make sure that every entity in the chain knows what's going on, including the recruit, right? That the recruit is clear with the collective, that the collective is clear with the guard, that the collective and the guard at least understand the needs of the program in a way that, in a way that meets the coaches and staff's, needs and expectations and that doesn't mean that they're saying go pay this player this much i don't think you have to do that but i think you can say this is the kind of comp this is the way we want to build the roster and how you help us build that roster is up to you but this is the way we want to build it and sort of have that cascade down and i'm not sure that that necessarily happened the whole way through here yeah just absolutely wild wild scenario here uh 13 million what about that number will I well mean, that's ridiculous because when you, <laughs> yeah, when you talk about that number real quick well and and this actually speaks to, this speaks to a bigger problem which is that you know and and i've been i've been harping on this for a while maybe privately i'm not sure i've even said it on here but I, i'm actually working on a tool right now to try to put evaluation on players that are that's not you know on three has something where they're looking at nil valuations and those sorts of things but the reality is is that pricing is just supply and demand and so if there's an enormous supply of five-star players and there's not much demand, the price is going to be low. If there's a huge demand for five-star players and there's a, you know, and, and there's a limited supply, well, then the price is going to go up. And we've seen price inflation, I think, for many different folks along the way. I think Rashada, you and I've talked about it. He's a very good prospect. He's not a can't miss prospect. And so that amount of funding for a for a guy who's not a can't miss prospect. I think raises some eyebrows and says something about, you know, is there clear guidance or is there a clear strategy in terms of how to value the different players at different positions and at the different spot in the rankings? Now, you know, look, the evaluation by the people who are making these decisions, whether it's the collective or the guard or the the staff or whoever, the evaluations may peg Rashada as this is a can't miss prospect. Their evaluations may be different than 24 sevens and those sorts of things. And so, Hey, if they look at him and say he's a can't miss prospect, then he's worth something. The question is, is he worth more? The athletic had had shown had a contract earlier this year, an NIL, an NIL contract. And you know, it was alleged that it was I am Oliva, the number four ranked overall player in the country. Um going to Tennessee. And, and, and I'm not sure that that ever got connected. So, you know, it, it may not necessarily, but if that's the implication that the number four ranked guy in the country who's a quarterback ended up, I think the deal was around 8 million bucks. Mm -hmm. If that's what that is, then the 47th or 48th ranked player, which is, I think what Rashada was um, or is um, shouldn't be getting 5 million more than that person. Right. I think, but again, it's a question of need and it's a question of demand. If Miami and Florida were competing, uh, competing for a specific player and they both had an evaluation on him that said, this kid's going to be really, really, really good. 
And then they, it just starts going, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that that's the way the market works, right? Like the, the market is actually set up to do that. Like when you go to work tomorrow, if you go in and say, I can get $20,000 more if I go work at your competitor. Now, obviously you've got non-competes and things like that in, in contracts that, that you've probably signed. But let's say you can go to somebody who's not a direct competitor and you can make 20 grand more tomorrow. The expectation isn't that the company goes, well, you committed to us. And so you're going to sit here for the next three years working for us, even though you know you can make more money someplace else. No, they're going to come in and they're either going to say, we'll match it. And hopefully you're happy because you're a valuable member of society or a valuable member of our company. Or what they'll say is, we won't match it. Congratulations. Shake your hand. And then you put in your two weeks notice and that's it, right? Like the the reality that the idea that the NCAA football, now that they've opened up things to a market, would be any different is confusing to me. I, I just look at it and I say, this may be the one time in Jaden Rashad's life or any of these recruits' lives that they have the leverage to be able to make life-changing money. Because if he if he steps out for a workout next week and shreds an ACL, I hope it doesn't happen. But if that happens and you know he ends up not being able to fulfill his dreams and, and play in the NFL and that sort of stuff – you know, th these sorts of NIL opportunities give him the ability to do that. So I don't begrudge people using the leverage that they have. And in fact, given the timelines, I don't think that's what happened here. I think, I think he had an agreement in his hands. And I think that's actually one of the things that may end up, <laughs> end up causing Florida some trouble. Cause if, if, if an entity and it's not Florida necessarily, but if an entity signed a contract, I don't know what the contract says. I don't know what the escape clauses were. I don't know what grounds for termination are. And I'm not an attorney. But if you signed a contract, there's usually an expectation that you're going to carry out that contract. And if Florida hasn't done that, then there, potentially there's there's liability on the other side as well. Well, let's talk about another scenario here. I got this from uh, the Swamp Things podcast or Swamp Things talk podcast with Edgar Thompson from the Orlando Sentinel, who reported that $13 million figure. And Mark Long from the AP, uh, they they went back and forth on this issue. Long indicated that there may have been a last minute request to increase the deal. This is the only place I heard this from, but this is in an exchange with Thompson on the podcast. Long said the following regarding Rashada. This is from Long. So he's probably sitting there and looking and saying that this team is desperate. He was indicating after watching the bowl game in the last few games and then the quarterback situation deteriorating, you know, with the loss of Kitna, we don't have Stokes in the class anymore. Like just clearly seeing that he's going to be the guy, right? The team's desperate. So I'm this back to long. So I'm going to go back and ask for more money. You can't blame them because that's where this is headed. It's all about supply and demand, right? The Gators have a demand for a quarterback. He's the only supply chain right now signed up to go to Gainesville. So he goes back and asks and asks for instead of whatever the deal had been, I think it was uh, $1 million a year. He's asking for 3.25 a year, which is tripling the offer, which is insane, uh, probably to the Gators credit that they balked and said, we're not paying that. So, Will, that's our, that's the only place I've heard that version of the story again, you know, this is totally – this is coming from Mark Long. This is what he's putting out there on the podcast there. I had not heard that version of the story anywhere else, but we're just – let's cover all scenarios tonight. So if that's the case, if the Rashadas are coming back and asking for more at the last minute, seems to be understandable as to why there might be some level uh, of uh, hesitancy to fulfill such a request. However – I, I don't know how likely that scenario is. I'm I'm not sure I, I, I'm bought in on that scenario. I mean, uh, why? Because it doesn't make sense with the timeline. Like I, I look at it and I say, if so, the bowl game is December 17th, early signing day is December 20th. So you look at it and say, okay, Florida struggles. Jack Miller struggles in that bowl game. Hey, that gives him leverage. But if you're Florida, wouldn't like, why would you sign? Why would you send him? an NLI, why would you send him the national letter of intent if you don't have a deal worked out? Because you know, you're, if you don't have the deal worked out, you know, you're going to end up at this point downstream. Now maybe, right. maybe it's a, maybe it's a, Hey, we'll get a deal done afterwards. And we sort of got the, the framework set up and we just need to work out details and things like that. But that's the only way that makes but sense. But details is being three X off of each other 
are, are a little bit different, right? Uh, <laughs> again, like you said, it's the only it's the only place that we've heard that. But I think it's worth bringing up because I don't want to yeah. sit here and just like trash any of these organizations. And and I think we should say that is I think everyone is doing the best that they can. Yeah. Who's who's in this specific space? Like Rashada has leverage and he's trying to make the most amount of money that he can with the leverage that he has. The collective is trying to serve the needs of the organization, which clearly needs to be able to execute NIL, NIL deals in order to bring in high level recruits. The guard is trying to support the university in a way that the collective just can't because their fundraising mechanisms are different. And Napier and Strickland, I mean, they understand that the high level talent is what's necessary to, to do this, but they're also managing the culture of the, of the, of the team. Um, um, and I get it because culture does matter and you don't just want one guy making a boatload of money and everybody else making, making peanuts at the same time. I think it's probably naive to believe that the entire recruiting class is essentially getting peanuts and that Rashada was the only one getting some sort of money or some sort of funding when it comes to, comes to NIL. And so, you know, they've, they've executed some sort of deal at some point along the way for either the transfers who are coming in or the recruits who are coming in, or even keeping some of the guys who, who are coming back for the team this year. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time believing that somebody comes up to you three days before signing day and says, I need more. And you go, okay, here's your national letter of intent. And we'll work it out after that. I think that's something you would want to have nailed down. And if you don't have it, or if you're, if the program is sending them an NLI and you don't have the finances nailed down, then I think that speaks to a lack of communication, which, you know, look, I mean, Napier and Strickland can't tell the collective give uh, legally, they can't tell the collective, give this guy this amount of money, but they can certainly ask the collective, do you have a deal? <laughs> Right. And so somewhere in there, the, the communication is like, you know, are we good sending this kid the national, the, the NLI so that he can sign up? And and again, how, how you do that and what channels that needs to be done through, I don't know, but there has to be a mechanism to do that. Right. They have to be able to communicate. And I think that's really the story here is that they're somewhere in the chain and maybe in multiple links in the chain. I think that's sort of the thing is it's probably multiple links in the chain. There were miscommunications along the way. And, you know, when there are miscommunications, you start to you start to breed mistrust and when you breed mistrust well now all of a sudden you know parties can't get together and negotiate because it's no longer about um making sure that everybody gets the best deal for them it's now about you know making sure that somebody doesn't pull wool over your eyes on a particular deal and you know again i don't think any of these entities had ill will i just think that you know certainly there were some communication breakdowns that uh that caused some issues yeah I, i'm looking at this too and i know this is um uh... You know, everybody keeps talking about this being a stain on Florida's reputation, especially this early in NIL, and people are going to use this in negative recruiting and blah, blah, blah. But I this issue is coming to everyone nationwide. This is going to be an issue uh, to – there's going to be variations of this type of issue with almost every school out there at some point if nothing changes because the spirit of NIL has been completely trashed. <laughs> it's it's already a distant memory. It's supposed to be name, image, and likeness. You're not supposed to do the pay for play. Uh, I think that's clearly being abused in many situations. Not at our fine institution, Will. Not at our fine institution, of course. But, you know, almost almost everywhere, almost everywhere in college football. Uh if if the NCAA actually cared about fixing this, I, I think that they could figure it out. Uh, it, it, you can get rid of the idea of this whole thing about third parties having to support this financially. Uh, that's you're going to run into to issues where people are promised things that they can't deliver. Uh, th this is going to happen if you if you especially if you don't allow them to communicate with the professionals, with the AD, with the coach. How can you not allow that? So there has to be some things that are changed on that front, I believe. But I also believe the NCAA is sitting back and that they aren't actually that interested in fixing all this mess because that would mess with the school's money. That would that would mean that the players are getting to dip into some of that $50 million a year pot that uh, every SEC school is getting for their TV contract. That would force the schools to acknowledge the players as employees, and that would – completely disrupt the system. So we're, we're they're trying to find ways to get money in the player's pocket through this goofy 
charade of a NIL system that is essentially pay for play. But I just want to point that out how much how much flaws exist in the current structure of the system. That yes, it's on our doorstep today. Yes, it's an embarrassment for Florida today. But you see these, you know, the people that are in the forefront of this. I mentioned Heighton or Halfcott, right? Uh, Gator Jen's out there doing. These people are are Gator Gators who love their school, who are trying their best right now for their school. Eddie Rojas, right? And they've stepped up to run these programs as third party entities. So I. I can't I can't fault them for getting caught in a situation like this here or there, but obviously there needs to be some form of uh, um, revisiting the situation, figuring out what the root cause was here, fix the issue, and, and move forward. So yeah, well, I, honestly, I, I, there, there, we two things can be true at the same time, right? This can be something that ha- so we can acknowledge that this isn't happening at any other school in the country. And so the fact that it is happening at Florida is a problem, right? It is. It's a problem. While also acknowledging that the people who are working on these sorts of things, the donors, the people who are running the collectives, the staff, these people care, right? And probably care more than we do. And certainly certainly those who are getting paid to do this sort of thing care more than we do. But maybe even the volunteers care more than we do, right? Or more than the guys who are getting paid because at the end of the day, these these are people who just care about the university. At the same time, and this is where I think everything sort of flows, is you've heard a lot of people blaming Billy Napier and a lot of people blaming Scott Strickland. And I, I agree from the stand, or I disagree from the standpoint of these guys legally and probably ethically are really going to struggle to be able to closely communicate with the third party entities that are trying to execute NIL deals. I think the NCAA specifically because of some of the things you laid out is not looking for a lawsuit. And so you can skirt the edges and you can decide to skirt the edges. And I think there are schools that have skirted the edges and are going to get away with it because the NCAA is worried that they're much more worried about their TV money being accessed for all the things you mentioned than they are about whether NIL is a little bit goofy. So right. all, all that can be said. The That's place what they're where- actually interested in protecting, not the 17 yeah. year old quarterback who's going to have to redo his entire not 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 Rashada. They don't care about that kid. They care about themselves. Well, exactly. And if yeah. Rashada gets money because of it, then I mean, really, it's kind of been a brilliant move by the NCAA. They've opened up a brand new revenue source by having mm-hmm. these collectives and all that sort of stuff attached. That's money that might have gone to the university before, but I don't think so. I think this is a brand new revenue source that essentially they now know, hey, look, there's there's money that people will give to us if it comes to actually like bringing in better recruits. And they'll eventually find a way to put that money in their coffers if they have to play players directly. But yeah. um, where I was going, though, is I think I, I agree that Strickland and, and Napier can't necessarily – connect specifically with these entities but what they can do is they can help set the strategic vision of the organization and if you're extraordinarily crystal clear about the strategic vision of your organization then everything flows from that so when billy napier got up over the summer and said we're not going to get into bidding wars for nil that isn't going to fundraise for for these third party for these third party entities, right? Like getting up there and saying we don't want to get in a bidding war. That's not what the Gators are about. Well, now you got a problem, right? Because now you've got these third party entities that are trying to raise funds, but you're saying outright we're not going to get in a bidding wars. Essentially, we don't need funds. And so the strategic vision of the organization is not aligned with the things and the realities of what you need to do to bring in recruits today. And look, you may not like NIL. You, you may not like that these kids are, you know, Napier likes to talk about how NIL is a part of the decision. Well, for some kids, it's going to be 99% of the part of the decision. And some kids, it's going to be 1% of the overall decision. And the question is, are you only going to recruit people who are, you know, one, five, 10%? That's their decision. Or are you strategically going to go get those guys who specifically fit that profile and are going to require that strong NIL deal? And again, I'm not saying that that Napier says, this is a player and I want you to go get him. I'm saying you've got to set the vision of here's the budget I need. I think we're going to need, or how do I help you fundraise so that when we say these are our targets, you can decide to allocate those resources in a way that is efficient and a way that values players in a similar way to the way we do. And 
you know, without that out there, without that strategic vision, what you end up with is people guessing at what the strategic vision should be. And you end up with someone, you know, look, I mean, we already talked about it. 13 million for Rashada is, is an, ex- is an extraordinary amount of money and good for him to be able to secure that deal. But that's not a deal that I would have said is a good deal from a financial perspective for Florida or for this recruiting class. I suspect you could take that money, spread it over multiple players and potentially, you know, you miss out on the quarterback, but do you get a better tackle or a better running back or those sorts of things? Um, And those are questions that these collectives are going to have to make, but that has to be, but I mean, let's be honest, Billy Napier has to manage his roster, right? So if the collective goes out and says, we're only going to pay top dollar for running backs and all of a sudden he's got 17 running backs on his roster, that doesn't do him any good either. So there has to be some sort of strategic vision about what the, what the organization's goals are, how they're going to accomplish those goals. And then he has to work in concert, not necessarily to go out and shill for a specific player, but to aid these third party entities in, in their fundraising. And again, I don't think it's specifically on Napier. I don't think it's specifically on Strickland and I don't think it's specifically on the collective, but without that strategic vision, it becomes very difficult to then for all these other entities, I think to fall within that. So basically what I'm saying is you got to give people a filter through which you're looking so that they understand that when they make a decision, the decision is aligned with your goals and vision for the, for the, for the program. And if you can't do that, what ends up happening is, is that people don't trust you. And then the other thing that happens is people can't make decisions because they always feel like if they make a decision, well, that might be, get second guessed. I don't understand if that fits within the vision. I, you know, I, I just don't get it. Um, I don't know whether I should, you know, should I up a bit on this particular player? Is it worth going after this particular person? And again, I'm not saying that Napier has to say Jaden Rashad, go get him. I'm saying that, you know, what is the general feeling for the program in terms of, the value of a high level quarterback year after year after year, you can communicate that to these entities and, and help them make those sorts of choices. It's an interesting perspective there. I look, we spent a a bunch of time here on the Rashada issue. It's obviously something that is going, I I think if Florida is smart, I think we try to release the kid from his letter of intent. Let's get this thing closed out as quick as possible. (laughs) Let's let's get this thing done. You have to. I yeah. mean, the the reality is, is that, and I still don't think that probably ends everything. I mean, given some of the reporting out there, there's, I would be surprised if there are not lawsuits that, that end up being filed. Maybe yeah. it gets resolved without that, but uh, you know, I, I, I think the story is long from over. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I, I just keep that, keep that entire structure in mind though, before I, before heavily criticizing the collective or anything. Cause I think a lot of those people, they, they really are. Hey, 19 other guys somehow signed and didn't have issues. Right. So I, I, I you got to keep that perspective. Well, I know it's something that needs to get fixed, but I also like got to see the bigger picture on this too. All Again, right, let's two, th- two things can be true, right? Two things yeah. can be true. These people can be working very, very hard and somewhere along the way. And I don't know where it is, but somewhere along the way, something got screwed up. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, that's, really rough when you consider where that puts Florida's recruiting class and where it puts the quarterback room. All right. So this Rashada nonsense, this is just put it down. Let's move on to six bits here. I'm going to play a video for everybody real quick. Let's, let's uh, try to maybe boost the spirits a little bit here. Check out this video. As far as Billy Napier. Spent quite a bit of time chit-chatting and getting to know each other. I didn't have him come find me. I found him. And I just thought the guy's amazing. He's so meticulous, so planning, so low. He looks so low keyed, but man, he's going a mile a minute. Okay. This guy knows what the hell he's doing. I wish Gator Nation, that is always so. I guess we feel entitled because of Urban and Spurrier, okay? But I wish Gator Nation would understand what Billy was actually brought here to do. It wasn't just to coach football. A lot of stuff to clean up. A lot of minds to change. A lot of... He's got to do so much more than just be a football coach. And... I met Ash Para, 
who is his right hand person. He's his chief, he's his chief of staff. Love Ash. It's easy to work with people that you love and that you care about. And I just took to those two guys, and they took to me, and and I tell my guys because I'm I'm the one that gathers the guys to help with an IL, and, and I bring you know money guys in and all that kind of stuff. But to me, what I say to these guys this first year. It's going to be ugly. How do you build and fly a plane at the same time? That's what he's got to do. So all my guys that are working with me, I just preach blind faith right now. Blind faith. Most fans, and fans are short for fanatical, okay? Most fans latch on to every word said on the boards, every negative thing that might come out of rumor. We don't listen. My group and I don't listen to the noise in the system. We know the person, Billy Napier. We know the person, Ash Perra. We know the coaches, the person. And we're 100% behind them. We're 100% behind them. And we knew it was going to be ugly this this first year. We knew. Look, I played for Charlie Pell, 79-80. I came when Charlie first came here. I've lived through what's happening now. I was a player. That first spring that Charlie Pell came here in 1979, he got rid of over 25 scholarship players. Same thing as now. Out, out. He called it getting rid of the nut rats. Okay? And... So I've lived this. I know what this is all about. And that first year, we went all 10 and 1. But back then, there's no instant media. Could never do that now. You'd be crucified. All 10 and 1. But my senior year, 1980, 8 and 4, kick Maryland's butt in the Tangerine Bowl. Biggest turnaround ever in college football history up until that point, year to year. So I know what's going on here, man. I've lived it. I was a Gator the first time it was happening. Unfortunately, a lot of people seem to think, a lot of fans think that Florida football started with Steve Spurrier. And we love our Spur guy. He's our guy, man. He's everything. Okay? But we were before that. We experienced what's going on now. That's why I understand. And that's why the blind faith. Because I know what can happen. I know what that means. Uh, those are words from Wally Smaver. Wally Smaver. He said, I, I love the quote, Will. How do you how do you build and fly a plane at the same time? <laughs> and you know, he stressed we're 100 percent behind them with the program here with Billy Napier and the vision and everything else. And I, I thought this was a timely video considering what's going on with the Rashada news and it's been a lot of negativity around that. Uh, it's been a rough season too, quite frankly, first year for Napier is kind of rough here. So, and we're heading into the, in the 2023 looking at a roster that's still got a lot of room to build and they're still, they are adding, we'll talk about the transfer portal here in a minute. They are adding players uh, almost every few days now, but just a little dose of optimism in, in, in a time that's been a little rough here. So I, I love the comparison between what's going on right now and what happened at the beginning of the Charlie Pell era. For those of you who don't know, 0-10-1 in 1979, and Pell really had to tear the thing down to the foundation and then rebuild from there. And he did rebuild. It did turn out to be, like, after a few seasons, they ended up getting to the point where, you know, you rise to that number one ranking. You eventually win the first SEC title in school history, bring in talent after talent over a few years. But it took a few years to build. If the program had the same mindset back then as it did today, I'm not sure we built some of those classes that we were able to build. Uh, you gave the guy some time to actually build it. And I know we've hit a few speed bumps along the way here overall, but I, I do think that if we're patient with Napier and if I know the Spurrier and Meyer championship standards there, Right. I, I want to beat Georgia. I want to beat Alabama as bad as anybody else. But 
if we give the guy some time, and if we look at the fact that we've been through three coaches in the last decade, maybe we kind of reassess as a program what the approach is overall and understand that because we're entering into this whole new world of NIL, that there are going to be some some of those speed bumps along the way, some of the issues along the way that if we're expecting Florida to operate at the forefront of the NIL era, that's we're going to be the, the, the school making some of those mistakes out front. You know, we might not be ahead of Texas A&M or Miami or some of these other schools thrown out for five stars, but I do think some patience is required here because I think one of the things you look at with Billy Napier, what was Billy Napier's strengths coming in? He was the guy with the big binder, right? He had the plan, the savingization of college football, right? He, 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 he was very much a part of that where everything's a system. Everything has uh, some, some level of control attached to it. No detail goes un- unturned. They, they, they don't ignore a single detail. I think with this NIL thing, it's so new. It's so rapidly changing. You saw what happened to the class last year, Will. We had a very slow start, and then all of a sudden in the summer, picked up big time. Probably some adjustments made behind closed doors. I think there's more adjustments to be made, and I think that a three-year window for this staff is a little unrealistic at this point if we're looking, if we're going to compare it to McElwain, Muschamp, and Mullen. I, I do think that with all the changes going on, with the amount of of, of turnover there's been in the first year. I think, I think uh, uh, Wally here has a good perspective on this in saying that we, we give this guy a little bit of time. I think good things can happen. And I, I honestly believe, I, I believe in the vision that Napier has for the program. And I think that there are, uh, there's a lot of potential if we give the guy time to build it properly. So, I mean, look, I think Billy Napier is going to win a lot of games at Florida. I don't understand his vision for the program. And that is so. What, so what don't you understand specifically? So he specifically said we're not going to bid for players in NIL, hmm. and now we're bidding for players in NIL. <laughs> now whether that's a third party entity that's bidding or the organization, like the reality is, is that those two things have to be in concert. He said this is a talent acquisition business, and if you take Jaden Rashad out of this class, which we have to do now, if you add the 2022 and the 2023 classes together. Basically you take the guys from the 20, the 2022 class and put it, plug in the guys in the same rating for 2023, Florida still doesn't end up in the top five this year from overall recruiting. So combination of the 2022 and 2023 classes is not a top five class. My expectation for this year was a top three class because bump classes in the SEC are something that is required to win in the SEC. You look at every SEC champion, every every SEC championship coach going back to Phil Fulmer, their bump class was top five. They had three five stars. They had like 19 blue chips. It, it, so Sykes wrote an article on, on uh, Reading Reaction years ago that, that detailed what is required to win big in the SEC. And the principle, and I think I agree with it, is that your, your vision when you come in is selling, we're going to turn this thing around. You're going to be a part of turning this around. That's all. That's, Hey, that's a big part of it. I think we're going to have, I, I'm not sure we're nine and three next year, given all the turnover, the youth and what's at quarterback, right? I think we're looking at another tough year. And so then it's a question of what are you selling when it comes to that sort of stuff? Now, look, if Napier hits on an abnormal number of, of these guys rated between 100 and 250 or 100 and 300, then I'll be wrong. And, you know, he's going to have, and I don't think this is going to be a program that goes three and nine under Napier. I don't think you're going to get the drop that you got with Muschamp in 2013. I don't think you're going to get the drop that you saw with McElwain in 2017 or the drop that we saw with Mullen last year, but the ceiling is extraordinarily limited right now. And, and, the 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 problem with comparing it to 1980 is that Florida's history back in 1980 was extraordinarily limited when it came to football. Florida now has a very different history and a different set of expectations. So the way I would compare it is like 1980, the Gators were much more of a startup business, right? Where the expectations are very, very small. Like you said, 1979 comes in, Pell comes in, 0, 10 and 1. And look, Doug Dickey had a little bit of success. There was an 8 and 4 in 74, 9 and 3 in 75, but nothing where you're competing for national championships or that sort of stuff. And then Pell comes in, has some success. Okay, that that's great. But what that sort of did was, you know, we've all heard the quote, I think it was Bear Bryant, who called Florida a sleeping giant. And 
he saw what it could be, but it hadn't been that yet. Right. So that's what I mean when I call it a startup, right? Is this is a company that's building and it's got, it's got investments and people are putting investments in it, but going eight and four in 1982 and nine and two in 1983, like those were things that everybody got really excited about. Cause we've never been there before. Florida has now been there. So now this is like Walmart, right? If Walmart tomorrow declared for bankruptcy and someone came in to rebuild Walmart, there would be expectations around from investors in terms of the rate of return that you would expect from Walmart. And that's the thing Napier's dealing with is he's dealing with an organization that he's taken over that he chose to take over that requires rebuilding, but at the same time has expectations along with it. And I just look at it and I think that there are strategies that you should take for a rebuild like that where there are expectations that are different than the strategy that you would take for a startup or that you would take at Louisiana if you're coming into a Sunbelt, um, into a Sunbelt organization where, you know, look, going five and zero, and then finishing out the year four and four for the rest of the year is a really successful season. Whereas you start out at Florida five and zero, now everybody's got championship aspirations. You finish the year four and four and everybody's going to the off season go, well, that was a crappy season because of the way that it finished. And, and so it's just different. It is. And I, I think there are multiple ways to build programs. I think Napier clearly has an idea or, and that's, that's one of the problems that I have is I, I think his actions indicate the, we're not going to bid for players method of of building the organization but i think the requirement especially in the nil or at least the thing that i'm worried about is that that is not the attitude that's going to bring a significant number of those elite players who are really going to make a difference but that doesn't mean that florida is going to be you know six and six in perpetuity i think napier is going to get the program to be better the question is is better but still not georgia or alabama good enough and I think this is the other aspect is, is that there's only usually one dominant coach in the SEC at any given time. And so you look at Urban Meyer, he obviously gets taken out in that SEC championship game with uh, with Nick Saban there in 2009. But Meyer sort of had his free reign there for four or five years. And Spurrier had his reign for more than a decade. And Fulmer would kind of pop up every once in a while. And but in the SEC, you know, you had Gene Stallings pop up one year, but for the most part, that's the that's the Spurrier, the fun and gun era, right? Then you have the Urban Meyer era, then you have the Nick Saban era, and unfortunately, I think we're moving into the Kirby Smart era. And there are there's a shortage of guys who just absolutely transcend a program. And look, Billy Napier may not be that guy, and that's not a uh, that's not a knock on Napier, but it does suggest, you know. The, the the expectations should probably be not national championship at least not right now. I I don't know if Napier's the guy, and that's why I don't I don't want to come across as just uh you know he did use the term uh, Wally used the term blind faith like I I think that we really don't have much option right now so yeah why not? However, I do want to say this: you look at Spurrier and you look at Meyer and yeah Meyer won that title in year two Spurrier won the SEC right off the bat Spurrier inherited a top 10 defense in a very good roster he didn't have to do a rebuild with this roster uh Galen Hall left him a full covered covered there Ron Zook wasn't winning but the young guys that he brought in the young guys he recruited as soon as Meyer supplemented that talent with a class of his own went to a different level well so and that my, would all Meyer, that would all that would but, all but, be... but Billy did not inherit that type of situation. He did not inherit that. He inherited really the polar opposite. And so when we compare, we use the word Spurrier and Meyer. I think you got to compare, make proper comparison on that. And I don't think that Napier came in. If Napier, I would say Napier inherited maybe half of what they inherited. Why, he, why Dan Mullen get fired? Dan Mullen got fired because he because the recruiting classes overall. He got fired because he was not because he was not recruiting at Alabama and Georgia's level, like right? Fund like because he was gonna he was or gonna really team. anywhere close to it. Yeah, I mean he would have turned around like it had he remained interested, and had the noise not been so loud, and had it you know had things not maybe gone south after that Oklahoma game. Um, you know, I think Mullen could have could have been perfectly capable of of going ten and three, almost every year that he was in Gainesville. But he wasn't going 13 and 0. And the expectation in Gainesville is 13 and 0. So the reason Billy Napier was brought in was to fix that. And you can talk about culture, you can talk about locker room, you can talk about all those different things. Those are tangential. But the thing that Billy Napier was brought in to do, or at least the hope that people had when he came in, and he fought, he he fomented that hope by saying, This is a talent acquisition business. I remember tweeting that 
when he said it and said, this guy gets it. And now you're looking at the results and the results are not matching that statement. But do you think Billy Napier is thrilled with the class right now? Do you think Billy Napier's like knocked that out of the park this year? Or, or do you think he, do you think he's getting tripped up by some of this? And, I mean, look at the Rashada situation. It's a perfect example. How is that Billy Napier's fault? Billy Napier well, closed that guy. He closed the commitment. He closed the deal. Loses that. I, I don't see that as Napier's issue. I think there are, Different issues that have never existed in college football. So, so that me, guys who have ask, been in the sport this. for like 15, no, no, no. 20 years who have learned a particular way of doing things have to relearn an entire aspect of the job. Yeah. And so, they're, they're getting on the job training where they're, we're seeing clear mistakes like this. All right, Nick, look, I, I work for an organization that sources materials from all over the world. COVID 19 hits, and all of a sudden you can't source materials from China. The entire landscape has changed and people have to figure out what to do. It's not good enough to just sit there and say, well, I can't get my customer, my product because I had to, because I have to buy something from China and it's, you find a different way to do it. And, and that is part of your job. So, you know, the, now those, a lot of those things get delegated within a company like mine, but I, I almost liken this, like the collective is like a toll manufacturer, right? You don't necessarily tell the toll manufacturer. So toll manufacturer, for those who don't know, is somebody who you give them the formula, but they make it for you because they have the equipment to make it for you. So if you're going to a toll manufacturer, you don't just say, um, you don't just say make it. And then whatever junk they give back to you, you go, oh, that's fine. Like you go in and you qualify the toll manufacturer and you give them guidance on what needs to be done. And you make sure they're the highest quality toll manufacturers out there. And you basically vet that entity because that entity is going to either allow you to deliver product to your customer or they're going to screw you when it comes time to deliver product to your customer. Because if they can't meet it on spec, on time and make it, and if they're not giving you what you need, then you're not going to be able to deliver and so that's why I go back to the strategic vision. I think I don't understand fundamentally what the strategic vision of Billy Napier is to fix this. So you say, is Napier happy? I hope he's not. But if he is, ha and, and again, this is I don't want to denigrate the players who are in the class. I think there are a lot of good players who are in the class. They're just starting to can't miss guys who aren't in the class. And those can't miss guys are the way you win the SEC and the way you win the national title. So if he doesn't think it's good enough, what is the plan? What is the strategic vision to actually get there? He's going to have to communicate that to the fans because the fans are intelligent enough to understand that recruiting is how you win national championships. They just watched what happens when you're Georgia and when you're TCU. And they just saw actually what happens when you're Michigan and you're TCU. Michigan is recruiting about the same level as Florida. And so in the Big Ten, you might be able to pick off Ohio State every once in a while. You might be able to get to the playoff. But the minute you come up against a big, bad, motivated SEC team, you're going to lose by 30 and maybe 60, depending on who you are. And that's it, right? So the 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 question is setting expectations, setting that vision. And I do think that that is the head coach's job at the end of the day the result you are what your record is and so billy napier right now at florida is six and seven and billy napier is what 14th and 17th in his two recruiting classes because that's where he's going to end up is right around 14th i would think maybe he'll climb up a spot or two um, by the time national signing day comes around but that's basically where he's going to end up and from an average player rate ranking that might be slightly ahead of dan mullen but from a uh, where you sit versus all of your competitors it's the exact same place. And that's what he was brought here to fix. And irrespective of whether the landscape has changed and things have changed, look, things change in business. Things change in, in recruiting. You know, 30 years ago, like I remember Dave and I in Gators Breakdown had Jacquez Green on years ago. And he was talking about how if you, if you were a kid who grew up in the state of Florida, you had three choices and you weren't going anywhere other than that, right? There wasn't five official visits. You weren't flying out to California to check out USC. If, if you grew up in, in, in Florida, like you had three options and you know, you're either going Florida, Florida state or Miami right. Completely and, and, those were, and those were your options. And so we can't sit there and go, wow, I really wish it was like it was back then when Florida, Florida state, and Miami just brought in all the guys from the state of Florida. Wouldn't it be nice if it was like that? Sure. It would be. I mean, it was awesome when those three teams were dominating and, and they, and you know, Florida, Florida State always played each other and they were in the top five. That's not happening anymore. And if you expect that to come back, you're going to be disappointed. And, and that's my point. I, I just think if you look at the fact that we've been rotating coaches every three, four years, the last decade here, you're not going to go out 
into the so if Napier does not if we were if we're another like six and six type season next year, which I think there's a decent shot we could be, and then it's eight and four. I don't think you're running the guy out of town year three, year four. And in this, I think this guy needs more time. I think there's different factors at play. And I think we've seen what it looks like to run guys out of town every three, four years. I don't know many coaches that are gonna have a much better looking resume than Napier. I mean, the guy coached under saving, coached with Dabo. Like, I, the guy has is coached with some of the best coaches of this generation, and he's coming in here. It's like you said. There's, there. I'm not saying there's not. There's plenty of room to criticize. There's room to criticize almost anything. But with Napier here, I think if if he can, if we continue to struggle with NIL, if we're if we're doing this next year, if we're having the same conversation two years from now about being the 15th ranked class, then that's not much different than what Mullen was putting out, and we can have a different conversation at that point, right? But to give the guy a little bit of time to rotate, that's why I wanted to play the Wally video because I felt like that's a good perspective from a, a longtime Gator that's seen a lot of Gator football. Yeah, I'm that. not saying we need. I'm not saying we need to fire the guy. I'm, I'm saying no. I'm not that. saying you say that. I, I, I'm not. I'm not even saying you're saying that. I'm saying I. I like we have done this cycle for the last decade of three to four years, and I think we need to change that cycle, and we need to give this guy who's a relatively young coach who is an up and comer in the grand scheme of things. If you give this guy time, I believe that the, I believe that overall it can work. There needs to be tweaks to the vision because I think you're right. I think some of your critiques are absolutely on point. Will, absolutely. However, I do think that this guy's capable of adjusting. I think that's actually a really interesting question. And I don't know the answer to it is, is it a better policy to rotate through? Like if you believe that, there are a limited number of Urban Myers and Nick Sabans and Kirby Smarts out there. Right? Are you better off rotating through coaches at a higher rate to try to find that one guy? Or if you believe, and I think the statistics bear this out, that those guys win fast, right? So if, if Napier goes out and goes six and six next year, I think we can probably say he's not in the Saban or Smart category. Now, that doesn't mean he won't win a bunch of games at Florida, but it means you're probably talking about a ceiling of Malzahn or or perhaps Gene Chizik. And look, those guys made it to the playoff and even Chizik won a national championship. So it's not as though you can't win in the SEC. And this has always been my point with recruiting. It's not that you can't catch lightning in a bottle with a, with a highly, with a highly competent or elite quarterback and make it to a playoff pick, pick off Georgia, potentially even win the sec championship. Kyle Trask, it's, it's, 20 that 20, you're, right. well, it's that you're not going to do it repeatedly. Right. right. So if you want the excellence of an Alabama or the excellence of Georgia, and again, I'm saying, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know that we have enough evidence to do it. I know what I think, but I'm not necessarily sure is, are you better? Like, is it, are you actually harming your program when you just turn it over every three or four years? Right. Or is it that people get frustrated that you're turning turning people over every three or four years, but what you're really doing is resetting and giving your organization an opportunity to try to find the next Urban Meyer, to find the next Steve Spurrier, to find the next Kirby Smart, to find the next Nick Saban? And I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think in many ways, though, that drives the decision-making is that once you know this guy isn't the national championship caliber coach, well, now there's an impetus to say, well, that's our only goal. And so we're going to turn over. Now, I don't know that that should be the only goal. I think, you know, when you look at like the 76ers up where I'm from, they, they went through that whole process where they just were terrible for years to try to get top draft picks. And now they're competing, right? They're like fourth or fifth in, in, in the playoff pecking order at this point. And they get Joel and beat out of it and they turn really good. But how many fans did they turn off over the span of that five or six years when they weren't winning at all? And how much fun were those seasons when they weren't winning at all? Would it have been more fun if they were a 500 team or if they went 50 and 32 and made it to the playoffs a few times and, and try to build the more... plane and fly it at the same time? Well, I mean, so again, but this, this is sort of my point, right? Is that building the plane and flying it at the same time in many ways, your shot approach at all of these things, right? We're not going to say, this is our vision and this is how we're going to execute it. It's, Hey, we're going to go out there and try to um, try to patch some holes through the transfer portal rather than going in the high school recruiting ranks and playing guys who are young and just telling you guys, this is going to be a rough season. We're going to go two and 10, but the two and 10 is going to turn into eight and four is going to turn into 10 and two because these guys got playing time when they're freshmen. Again, I don't know the answer to that question, but the, the, 
the goals of the of the program i think um have been clearly enunciated by strickland and as of right now i don't see the path to getting to those goals given what i'm seeing so far doesn't mean you don't give napier time doesn't mean you don't give strickland time doesn't mean you don't give the collective time all those sorts of things but what it does mean is that you look at it and go we need to have uh uh uh, there there needs to be an inventory of places where things can improve because as of right now, it's not on the path to getting to where these folks have stated they want to be. Yeah. I, I if, if the 12 team playoff were coming in 2023, I would not expect Florida to make it, but by 2024, that'll be 30 year on the roster to be top 12 in the country. Don't think that's a big ask. I think that that 12 team playoff, uh, that's not going to be a big ask to get there for, uh, I look forward to being. Series, I look forward so. to being one of the final four SEC teams. Yeah, when, when when we get to the twelve. There you go. All right, let's go on to dollar. Let's wrap this thing up. Uh, Mike Micah uh, Mazuka out of Baylor, six foot five, three hundred thirty one pounds, left guard, two years of elig- eligibility re- uh, remaining. Originally, um, I think he'd say he's from Philly, but he ended up playing his high school ball in Baltimore, Maryland. Started ten games. Primarily a left guard for the Bears last season, graded out as the second best guard in the Big 12, according to PFF. So this is a nice pickup here in the transfer portal. Uh, I know I've been calling it the land of misfit toys, but this is this seems to be a good draw out of the basket here. Well, his run blocking grade was the best in the conference. That's great. We need that. It's <laughs> a good pickup. Mike Renner from PFF gave his thoughts on Mazuka explodes off the line of scrimmage and attacks with a mean streak. His pass pro is still a work in progress, though. And according to Jackson Posey of Inside the Bears, uh, he said the Bears rushing offense was ranked number 10 nationally uh, in terms of rushing touchdowns per game. And behind Mazuka the, and the rest of the offensive line, three Baylor running backs averaged over five yards per carry last season. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a big-time pickup for a lot of reasons. One is that if you look at most of the advanced stats, <laughs> Mazuka was behind one guy in most of those stats, and it was Osiris Torrance. So mm-hmm. from the standpoint of what Florida lost and who they're gaining, I think, and we saw the – I mean, it wasn't just him, but we saw what happened to the offensive line – when Torrance wasn't in there. And so having a guy who can step in and hopefully fill that role right away, this is a guy who started a lot of games. So you think about the offensive right. line where Florida should be worried based on the, uh, based on the depth chart and the guys that they have and the departure of Ethan white and Josh Brown, Braun and, and, and Tarquin out at tackle, you know, you think about the, and then garage going to the NFL, you know, you're losing 80% of your offensive line. The only person coming back is Eglikon. And so, and maybe Barber, if you consider him the starter at right, at right tackle. So you need bodies, right? And, and so, you need bodies. You need guys who have real starts at power five level. And, and Mazuka gives you that. The other thing he gives you is that we saw Cameron Waits play guard, play at guard. He really struggled, but Waits really profiles more as a tackle. And so if you bring Mazuka into the program, or now that you've brought Mazuka into the program, that allows you to take a guy like Waits, move him out to tackle. And now you've got Barber starting there. You've got William, William Harad. You got Jordan Herman. You got David Connor. And now you've got Cameron Waits also out there at tackle. You're starting to build depth at that particular spot. And if Waits turns out to be pretty good, and then if you've got Mazuka who can even just be a poor man's Osiris Torrance, like, you know, an NFL draft pick at the guard, he doesn't necessarily have to be a first round pick at the guard. And then, so now you start feeling a little bit more comfortable about the depth, depth chart, right? You got Egelkin at center, you got Mazuka at guard, you got Waits at tackle, you got Barber at tackle. And now the guys you're bringing in, like a Nigel Harris or like a Roderick Kearney or like the guys last year, Jalen Farmer and Christian Williams, those guys are all fighting for that other guard spot. And there's going to be competition for that spot as opposed to saying, Oh my God, we're going to have to have true freshmen or redshirt freshmen step into multiple roles on the offensive line. So to me, that's a big part of why having a guy like having a guy like Mizuka commit makes a big difference, not just his skills specifically, but because of what he does in the pecking order for the offensive line. This is a clear cut starter next year, probably going to be one of the top two or three impact guys that come in uh, with this, uh, the, all of all the new players we're adding here. So very excited about that pickup. I think that's a good one. Damian George, an offensive tackle from Alabama transfers in six foot six. 348 Houston, Texas native started three games in 2021 for the tide, but he only saw action in two games this past season, two eligibility, uh, two years of eligibility 
remaining. Originally a four-star prospect through ESPN. He was number 336 overall recruit in the 2020 cycle. Will, I – I didn't get a lot of details as to why he fell out of favor at, at, at Bama, but you can imagine the competition along that line is pretty stiff. And I know the line has not been a strength of this team the last couple of seasons. Yeah. I mean, well, so look, I mean, Florida clearly has a need at, at offensive line with all the guys who've left. Right. Um, and, and so I think that's some of it, right? You think about, and one of the things that we haven't really talked about when it comes to NIL is that the guys who are already at places, didn't have the leverage at any point along the way. So a lot of these guys going to the transfer portal this year are sort of experiencing that leverage. I have no inside information about what, uh, what George may or may not have gotten from an NIL perspective, but um, I, I find it hard to believe that, that a lot of these guys aren't transferring without some sort of um, without some sort of deal on the table. And um, you know, so with that, it's kind of hard, you know, it's like, Hey, this isn't the guy who's going to start at Alabama, but Alabama's backup's pretty good. Right. And so the question is, is he good enough to push? Like I said, Cameron Waits is a transfer. Billy Napier knows well, or transfer from Louisiana. Napier knows well, going to want to shift him out to tackle. Well, can George push that? Right. Can George make Waits get better or can George surpass Waits? And all of a sudden now you've got three tackles with Barber, George and Waits who are all out there and you're going to have an injury at some point on the offensive line. So being able to bring a guy in. Um, who's who's able to who's able to really excel um, makes a difference, right? But the big thing is, is Florida just needs bodies, and so from the standpoint of you know you now have five guys who are officially tackles. You've got Caden Jones that you've just got committed recently, the offensive tackle from New Orleans um, in this 2023 class. So you start piecing that together, and the numbers at offensive line, which just the numbers had nothing to do with talent, just the numbers had me worried two weeks ago. And with the additions of Jones, the addition of Mazuka, and the addition of George, I'm much less worried about the numbers than I was before. Even if these guys don't turn out to be stars, I think just the depth and having somebody who understands the way Alabama teaches offensive line, the competition level at a place like Alabama is somebody who's not going to be scared when he steps into a game against Missouri or Vanderbilt or, or Kentucky or Tennessee or something like that. Right. And I think there's value in that. Yeah. Yeah. I I think they've done a good job addressing this offensive line here. Uh, Definitely position where you're kind of looking at it and, and thinking things were pretty lean about a month or two ago, definitely picked it up here. So Significant pickups there in the transfer portal for the Gators. Uh, rough week, everyone. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. <laughs> Slowly but surely. I don't think uh, – I, I think I listened to, to Dave's podcast after the Rashada thing. He said, I'm waiting for that dull moment, everybody. <laughs> I like that. It's a good slogan. It never comes. Cover. It yeah. never comes. Look, I mean, I, I think I said this – I think I said this last week, but Florida is going to get better. Yeah. They're going to get better under Napier. And, you know, Napier may not bring Florida to where we want to be. Maybe he will. But, you know, the program is going to get better. The question then becomes just sort of looking at these benchmarks along the way and understanding how good is good enough when we talk about getting better. And that's really what we're parsing hairs on, right? A team like Michigan, who's rated 12th overall, I think, since 2014 in the national recruiting rankings, is fully capable of making a run to the playoffs as the playoffs expand to 12, there's going to be more opportunities. My concern is, is that especially in the sec, you start falling behind, you start falling behind people. But the the good news is, is that because things run in three and four year cycles in terms of guys going to the NFL, Mm -hmm. it only takes one class or maybe two classes to really turn things around. And so you're only one class away. And so if the infrastructure truly is getting fixed and you know, we've now got the facilities and, and these guys are making adjustments, then, Hey, I think there's still a possibility still hope and that was the thing is with dan mullen the the hope had run out like we there was just an understanding that that the recruiting was not going to get better i still think there's hope that the recruiting can get better there's hope that the on-field product can get better and as long as that's the case then i think we need to you know you mentioned supporting billy napier I, i think you know just because we're looking at it and saying with a critical eye that things need to change doesn't mean that we don't support billy napier or support the program overall um i i think you know, just like anything, there are going to be people in the comments here who criticize us for the opinions that we have. That's fine. We read them. And sometimes we agree with them. They make us better. Sometimes we disagree with them and we sit there and we text it back and forth and go get a load of this guy. But, <laughs> but you know, and, and that's honestly, that's what Napier should do. Right. I mean, if the points that we're making are valid, then he should look at it and go, oh, 
those are those are good points and hopefully he's not listening to us for advice on a regular basis but you know when those things when those ideas come through he should be saying oh that's a good point and when somebody brings up something that we or anybody else says that's stupid he should text it to his buddy or text it to their staff members and go get a load of these guys <laughs> like so um you know the good news is this isn't life or death right it's it's 13 games every year hopefully 15 games every year and you know i get a lot and this is one of the reasons why i struggle cuz i mathematically i understand that stripping things down to its studs might be the right way to build a program but fundamentally gator football is a familial thing for me and so having like three, four, five years out in the wilderness is not a very appealing thing. Especially and, while Georgia is doing what Georgia is doing right now. It's especially yeah. brutal right now. Oh, but yeah. if that's what we got to do to compete, you know what I'm tired of? I am tired of the inconsistency against a team like Georgia. I want to show up year in and year out knowing that we got the type of roster that can go up against a wagon like that. We got to be able to tired of the inconsistency against Kentucky. Uh, let's, get that, let's get that. We're one talking first. about Georgia. We can't like <laughs> yo, yo. Me and you. That's like talking about us getting six packs, man. Let's lose about ten pounds first, and then we can talk about six packs later, well, man. Well, hey, like here, here's beat here's Kentucky, all I know. beat South Carolina, and then worry about those guys. But like, we got a long way to go, and that's I guess that's well, the expectation. That I guess that's why I was harping so much on the support angle because I do think I see this as a severe rebuild. At this point, we are in a we are in the middle of a severe rebuild, the likes of which we really have not seen in the modern era of Gator football post Spurrier. And it's something that he did not inherit what Spurrier inherited. He did not inherit what Meyer inherited. And I think it's important to consider that and to get out of this cycle that we've been in, because I would much rather have a decade where we have one coach than a decade where we have four. Sure, so. but none of that matters. So I'm salty tonight because I had a customer dinner before we came here, and my customer walked into the meeting wearing a Georgia hat. <laughs> that sucks. That's cool. <laughs> it I just flew, sucks. I flew through Atlanta. I was up in Atlanta this weekend. College Football Hall of Fame was pretty cool, by the way. Definitely recommend checking that out if anybody's going to Atlanta. But I uh, saw plenty of Georgia uh, National Championship uh, memorabilia. Oh, and, and, and you know – Probably should have mentioned it at the beginning of the show, but that horrible story there with the uh, offensive tackle and the staffer uh, passing away in the car crash there up in Athens. So thoughts and prayers go out to uh, the Georgia football family uh, regarding that story. That's that's a terrible event, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, look, I, I think I, I think we're probably reminded from, at the beginning of the show. Yeah, I mean, we're reminded from time to time that uh, that this is just fun. Right. Yeah. And and that, you know, unfortunately, more than I would like to admit of my happiness is associated with these programs. But you're reminded from time to time and not just in sports, but sports tends to do it from time to time as well, um, you know, about the important things in life. And I mean, it was such a terrible story. I mean, like his brother passed away the same way. And, you know, when he was 20 in a car wreck and it's mm. just like, oh, it's so you, you just, your hearts go out. I mean, you know, I got four kids and, you know, my daughter's 14. And from the time she's 16 until the time she's 60, I'll probably be worrying about her every time she gets into a car. And, you know, it's just the parent's worst nightmare. And, and uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, it, it it dampens some of the things in terms of rivalries, but that's not what's important. What's important is is that hopefully those people, hopefully the familial aspect of football, makes those people feel like they makes all the people makes all the family members of the victims feel like they're surrounded by by people who who mean well and people who can help support them. And you know, if football provides a little bit of that, then then that's great. But obviously, it's not really all that important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, tough, tough news there up in Athens. All right, let's uh, wrap up the show here. Thank you for everybody if you're still with us. Thanks for sticking with us. This was a long episode. Uh, we're trying to cut it down a little bit, make it a little more manageable for everybody. But uh, we'll, you know, sometimes we got topics like this to talk about, so it gets a little carried away at times. But we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, go Gators. Go Gators. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles, and as always, go Gators.